Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you may be in the world. My name is Andres Velasco. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Policy here at the LSE. And um, I want to welcome you to our online event in which uh, my dear friend, uh, Professor Neil Ferguson is going to be talking and discussing um, his new book, Doom, the Politics of Catastrophe. I am very, very pleased to be chairing this event uh, this evening, at least London time. And I am very, very pleased that uh, Neil is joining us tonight. But before I do that, let me just make a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, I'm sure there are Twitter users in the audience and the hashtag for tonight's event is um, LSE COVID-19, hashtag of course, LSE COVID-19. And uh, let me remind you also that this event is being recorded and the recording will be available later. Um, what Neil and I are going to do is engage in conversation for a little bit. Neil is going to tell us about the main ideas in his book, and then, um, and then we will open it up to Q&A uh, with the audience. Let me um, introduce um, Professor Ferguson, who, as the cliche goes, needs no introduction, but uh, just in case uh, he does, Neil is one of Britain's uh, most renowned historians. Uh, nowadays, he is the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution out in sunny California, or actually it's Northern California, so it's probably not that sunny. He is also a Senior Faculty Fellow of the Belfer Center for Science at the Kennedy School at Harvard, where I used to spend a lot of time, and a visiting professor at Tsinghua in Beijing. So Neil, let's get started, um, and let me let me uh, pose one question to you to get the ball rolling. Amartya Sen famously said many many years ago that there are no famines in democracies. There are no famines in places where the government is responsive and accountable. And I suppose the message behind uh, that line is. Ultimately, catastrophes are political events. Should we be thinking of COVID as a political event? Is politics really at the core of the really bad catastrophes that affect humanity? Is that a fair way of thinking about the main message of your book? Over to you, Neil. And again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Andres. So it's a great pleasure to join you uh, and to be able to uh, participate in the London School of Economics event uh, from this great distance. Uh, and one of the little silver linings of the cloud of the pandemic has been that it's actually made this kind of interaction easier, despite the great geographical distances between Stanford and LSE. And it's nice to be back at LSE, where I was a visiting professor, I think, 10 years ago. Uh, uh, back in the day when Arna Westad was uh, was there, but uh, but greetings to those that I, I got to know at that time. The answer to your question, which is an excellent question, is yes. And Amartya Sen had uh, a significant influence on my thinking when I came to write this book. As you say, uh, Sen's famous observation was that famines don't happen in democracies, and more broadly that that we shouldn't think of famines as ma as natural catastrophes, but as as in many ways man-made. Uh, that when uh, a shortage of, of food occurs, even if the result, it, it, even if it's the cause caused by a, a drought or a flood or some other natural event, it ultimately is it's human agency that determines if there's going to be starvation and excess mortality. So I remember reading that many years ago and absorbing it, and uh, it was only really as I was writing Doom, that the penny dropped. And I asked myself, well, if that is true of famines, why shouldn't it be true of other forms of disaster, including pandemics? Doom is a, a general history of disaster. It's an attempt to bring all the various kinds of disaster under one roof and to think systematically about the problem of disaster, which is a recurrent feature of, of history, obviously. But when you come to ponder it, there's no obvious reason why famines should be different from pandemics or, for that matter, other natural disasters, even geological ones. 
such as volcanic eruptions or earthquakes. And let me try to illustrate this with the example of, of COVID-19, which is fresh in everybody's minds. Although the, the pathogen, the virus SARS-CoV-2, has certain uh, uh, readily identifiable properties, we quickly were able to understand its genetic structure and quite quickly understand the way that it made people sick, its impact has varied enormously from, from country to country. Uh, and even more strikingly, countries that were supposed to be well prepared for a pandemic, such as the United States and the United Kingdom, which were ranked number one and number two for preparedness as recently as 2019, did, did really badly. And, and countries that might not be thought of as being so well resourced, such as Taiwan or or South Korea did much, much better. I mean, if everybody had done badly, this wouldn't really be a conversation. But the reality is there's been enormous variance in, in performance uh, with the same virus uh, attacking populations and no really massive uh, and compelling uh, genetic or other biological explanations for why things have gone so much worse in in, in the UK and the US. After all, they, they, they didn't go badly, nearly as badly in New Zealand and Australia, which are not genetically very different populations. So I think we have a, a, a starting point here for a general argument. Uh, and the, the subtitle of the book, The Politics of Catastrophe, is supposed to make the point that, that generally there is no real distinction between a man-made and a natural disaster. Sure, a war is, is, is men killing men, mostly at the orders of men. And, and a pandemic is, is germs of some sort or another killing, killing people. But in truth, excess mortality is a reflection to a large extent of, of, of human decision making, uh, politics very broadly defined. And if you're sitting there thinking, oh, come on, surely a volcanic eruption is a natural disaster. Well, yes, but it's not such a disaster if it happens on an uninhabited island. Uh, whereas if it happens and, and, and you happen to have built a bunch of towns at the foot of the volcano, then there will be excess mortality if it's a really big eruption. And you might say, well, the Romans had no reason to understand uh, volcanic eruptions when Vesuvius blew, sure. But subsequently, what's fascinating is that people keep building and rebuilding cities next to volcanoes and, and on fault lines. So if you, if you define politics broadly enough, I think it's fair to say that disasters are all ultimately man-made. In other words, it's, it's human decision-making that determines excess mortality, uh, even if the, the starting point of the disaster is natural. And that's really a March Ascend's point writ large. And let me add one final thought. I don't think it's as clear that democracies do better in all forms of disaster. I mean, it, it certainly seems true in the case of famines, and you can't imagine the 1930s famine that struck uh, Ukraine having happened in a dem democratic Russia uh, or democratic Russian empire. And it's hard to imagine Mao Zedong's Great Leap Forward happening, as, as Amartya famously said, in India. But when you look at how democracies did in the face of a pandemic, and not only this pandemic, but other pandemics over the last century or so, it's much less clear that it's advantageous to be a democracy. And that's a puzzle, because I find myself asking, well, if, if democracies are better at dealing with, with famines, you know, why are, they, why are they not better at dealing with pandemics? And that's one of the questions that I wanted to address in the book. And one of the advantages, I think, of bringing all the different forms of disaster together kind of throwing away the familiar dichotomy between natural and man-made and just trying to think generally about disaster. I think this is a really important point and one that I'm pretty sympathetic to. Um, you mentioned earthquakes among the disasters. I come from the most earthquake prone country in the planet. So I've lived through quite a few. Uh, I was in government in Chile a bit over a decade ago and um, we had a big, big earthquake. And at about the same time, Haiti had a smaller earthquake. And a very painful uh, lesson I learned from that episode is that what you do before the earthquake matters hugely. In a pretty big earthquake, uh, about 500 people died in Chile, which of course is a lot of people. But given the magnitude of the earthquake, it is quite striking that uh, the death toll in a country like Haiti I know nobody's quite sure, but it ranges from 100,000 to about 320,000. So clearly, preparedness is a big, big deal. One point you make in the book, which I thought was fascinating, is that 
you know, to prepare, you have to be aware that the thing is coming. But um, when somebody stands on a so soapbox and says, hey, there's, there's something coming, a pandemic is probable, uh, or don't build those houses next to the St. Andreas Fault in California, people are not very keen to listen. Um, so tell us a little bit about the politics of that in your mind. Why, why is it that we're being the calls of the Cassandras? Is it because we have too many Cassandras out there and they're not, or is it because there's something about democratic politics that leads us to look? It's a bit of both. The original Cassandra was not heeded. And uh, I delve into ancient Greek uh, tragedy to, to explore the significance of that. Part of the problem is that there are always way too many Cassandras predicting way more catastrophes than actually happen. And it's not clear how you can tell the, the good prophets from the bad ones, especially when you realize that disasters are inherently unpredictable. And this is a very important point that I try to establish in, in Do, that, that these are not things that, that you can predict with any real precision. It's even hard to attach probabilities to earthquakes, as you know, uh, uh, having uh, lived in, in Chile, that, 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 you, that you know where they can happen, but you don't know when and you don't know how big. And the same is true where I live, because I'm right next to San, the San Andreas Fault. And at some point, there will be a really big earthquake here. But nobody knows when uh, and, uh, and nobody knows how big, whether it will be as, as big as the really big one at the beginning of the 20th century. So that means that the Cassandras are... At, at some point, at some level, uh, not engaged in, in an entirely scientific activity because they're at attempting to predict the unpredictable. I think there's another problem, though, and that is that even if you could tell the, the right Cassandras, the good ones, the super forecaster Cassandras, if you want to use Philip Tetlock's term, uh, as a democratic politician, you're nearly always being asked to make some short-run sacrifice for the sake of preparedness, uh, that will be costly. And the temptation, particularly if your time horizon is a two or four year election cycle, is not to, to make that expensive sacrifice, but just to hope for the best. And this habit of kicking the can down the road was something Henry Kissinger defined as the problem of conjecture, that, that a democratic statesman doesn't have good incentives to take the costs of preemptive action because if you do the, the right kind of preparation and you either avert disaster or the disaster doesn't happen, then you've incurred the costs and there is nothing that people will be grateful for. Even if you've successfully avoided a, a disaster, the payoffs are not great. People don't go around saying, well, thank goodness that we didn't have World War Three. We should be immensely grateful to the statesman of the Cold War. That's just not how it works. So I think the problem is, is twofold, that the Cassandras are too numerous, they're predicting too many disasters. But in any case, even if you knew which ones were going to be right or which ones had a good track record, there would still be this disincentive uh, to prepare in a way that was, that was costly. Mm -hmm. Having said all that, I think it's worth adding that in the case of the pandemic, on paper, there was a lot of preparation. In the US in particular, uh, and in the UK too, there were elaborate pandemic preparedness plans. And one of the things that I found most fascinating about writing this book was realizing that often catastrophes are foreseen. This pandemic was predicted by numerous people, including some very eminent ones. Uh, Larry Brilliant gave a great TED talk about it in 2005. And we had a whole bureaucratic apparatus whose one job it was to prepare for this eventuality. So a really interesting question, and I don't think it applies exclusively to, to COVID-19, is why preparations can sometimes look very good on paper so that the US is ranked very high in terms of preparedness, but they don't work in practice when the catastrophe actually strikes. And I'm very interested in that disconnect between superficial or bureaucratic preparation and actual outcomes when when the plan somehow disintegrates on contact with the enemy not not only is that true in many military cases of disaster but it's true it turns out in public health disasters too
So let's stay with that thought for a minute. This is a sort of public policy, so I'm very interested in the what, what you seem to be saying is that countries that look good on paper actually um, is there anything we can learn any particular kind of country or political system uh, can we say democracies did better than non-democracies or maybe the other way around is there any general here is putting aside preparedness for a minute you know you talk about Failure about administrative failure, that kind of failure, and how to prevent it. I think there's a wrong answer to that question, and the wrong answer is that uh, the democracies did badly, especially if they had populist leaders, whereas China did really well. And that argument, which was very popular last year. I think exaggerates uh, the success uh, of China, and I use the term success advisedly because, after all, this this disaster began in China with an enormous uh, screw up of the initial outbreak. But I also think that it it doesn't do justice to some uh, very successful uh, democracies that that did really well. So I think if you if you just posit a kind of relationship between a uh, democratic system and outcome. There's no clear correlation. Some democracies did really well and some did really badly and some authoritarian regimes uh, did better and some did really terribly. So this doesn't seem to work in the way that a, a nice political science paper would, would like it to. The best performers were Taiwan and South Korea, measured in terms of uh, uh, the outcome in a reasonably large and advanced uh, economy, the public health outcome, but also the economic outcome. Taiwan in particular has only just had a significant outbreak of, of COVID-19 in the past couple of weeks. And by the standards of everybody else, it's kind of still a pretty small outbreak. The total death toll uh, is 14. And they're right next to China where this began. Now, actually, I'm so interested in why Taiwan did well that I, I got on the phone to Audrey Tang, the digital minister there on Monday, for a conversation about my hypothesis that Taiwan's success was in part its speed of response. And I'd advance a kind of general proposition that in, in a disaster, which you can't necessarily predict, it's all about speed of response. And Taiwan was very quick to respond uh, to the initial news uh, from Wuhan. And uh, I think rightly was skeptical about Chinese assurances that there was no human to human transmission at the beginning in early January. The other thing that the Taiwanese have done that no Western country did well was to use technology. This was also true in South Korea, to use technology in ways that were very creative, not, not so much in the sense of, of mass surveillance, which I think is how people in the West often think about this, but in terms of empowering citizens, uh, they had the same problem that we confronted of not enough masks at the beginning, but they used a, 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 an app, a software solution to, to effectively make sure that the masks went to the right people. They set up a contact tracing app very quickly. They didn't really need to use it, but they're using it now. And they've just thought much more, I think, about how technology can help uh, not only in, in making the public aware of a problem, but using the public uh, to crowdsource uh, responses. And this is Audrey Tang's distinctive contribution, I think, to, to the way democracy works, uh, the, the, the way in which in a whole bunch of domains they've been experimenting with, with technology. We failed in every single respect to learn from Taiwan and South Korea. We were slow where they were quick. So we dithered around in January and February and, and into March. We totally failed to ramp up testing, which they were able to do very, very successfully at the beginning. We didn't get to contact tracing in the UK until later uh, last year. And initially most people were very skeptical about contact tracing. Actually, it worked, it worked in England and it certainly worked in South Korea and it's working in Taiwan right now as they deal with this 
new outbreak. But above all, they were very good at quarantining and isolating people who were either infected or suspected of, of being infected and, and enforcing those quarantines. I think on those three metrics, those three key ways of containing the, the virus, just about no Western government did well. And it didn't matter whether it was a populist who was president or prime minister or not. There was excess mortality in most Western countries because very, very few of them got these things right. And so I'd say that the lesson is that there were democracies that got this. Partly they got it because they'd learned the lessons of SARS and MERS, and we really hadn't. By we, I mean our public health officials really hadn't. But I think there's a more general point. I think if you're Taiwan and South Korea, you have reasons to be paranoid because your neighbors are out to get you. And there are a bunch of my, different my, ways they can do it. Somebody's internet seems to be acting uh, out a little bit, but to you now. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, and then we will move on to Q&A from the audience. But, um, you know, I, I can see a few questions, but uh, if other people have questions that they would like to bring up, please do. Um, one last uh, um, a comment and a question, Neil. Um, you just touched on my comment, but uh, I, I want to underscore it. But I, I thought it was very interesting. You you say in the um, you say in the book that something that uh, Taiwan, Korea, and Israel uh, have in common is that they are countries that are perennially under threat. And there's something maybe in the mindset or in the political system of such countries that causes them to be more ready. Um, I thought that was that was a that was a thought provoking comment. But but on to my question, populism, you know, it's hard to have any conversation nowadays about populism. You give populists a free pass, more or less, um, in the book, maybe not entirely, but, um, you know, you, you're reluctant to attribute populism um, to the to the problems in places like the US or the UK. But if I look more broadly around the world, I would not be averse to calling Bolsonaro in Brazil, AMLO in Mexico, in India, Erdogan in Turkey in the Philippines, populists. And it's quite striking how all of these countries did very, very poorly. Uh, look at Pakistan next to India, uh, a country that on many grounds uh, in Etc. is similar to India. Excess deaths are much poor in Pakistan. They are and shouldn't populists take a bit of the blame in terms of a, a poor response? Can you tell us about that sort of thing? Yes, and I noticed the poor connection problem. I'm not quite sure uh, at whose end it is, and I hope that the audience is getting most of what we say. I don't give them a free pass. A doom is actually especially scathing about Donald Trump's performance uh, because it was hard to keep count of the number of mistakes he made. Yeah. And uh, you could go into equal uh, detail, I think, about mistakes that de Bolsonaro made in, in Brazil, where he was, in fact, even more reckless in his his, his attitude than, than Trump was, and that was saying something. So... <laughs> Superficially, there's a really compelling story here. Uh, just as it was, it was quite easy to to find fault with with Boris Johnson's uh, handling in the UK. But it's worth noting that when you look at excess mortality, which is the best measure of performance, uh, there isn't that clear cut a story here because there are plenty of countries with non populist governments that did as bad or worse. Uh, and that's the, the part of the reason that I think one has to be careful about leaping to the conclusion that counterfactually, it would have been much better if Joe Biden had got the job of president a year earlier, or if somehow Theresa May or, or David Cameron had survived, or if there were a Labour prime minister. Uh, I, I find these counterfactuals unconvincing. I think they might have made a difference, but it would have been marginal, because in truth, the reasons why excess mortality happened had to do with the public health bureaucracy's response more than with presidential or prime ministerial decision-making. 
if you are trying to answer the question, why did testing fail in the US for months? The answer is not Trump. The answer is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which screwed it up all on its own for basically bureaucratic reasons. And I think the same goes for contact tracing. Why was there no contact tracing? There's still no contact tracing in the US. The answer is because the big tech companies decided not to do it. And uh, so I think at the key points of failure, why was there no effective quarantining? It wasn't Trump who was sending uh, ill uh, elderly people back to care homes in New York. Uh, it was Andrew Cuomo. Uh, so I think Trump did disastrously, but if we tell ourselves it would all have been fine with a different president, we're not going to learn the right lessons. And that's the really key point I want to make. Even with a competent president, I don't think CDC would have done well. I don't think the pandemic preparedness plans would have been executed successfully. And I don't think we would have prevented community spread because those failures were not really the direct responsibility of, of the president. Now, not, not many people like this argument because it's so tempting to hate on Trump and, and blame him, just as many uh, British people have the same desire to, to pin blame on, on Boris Johnson or on Dominic Cummings or on whoever they hate in the government. But I just think we have to remember something Ron Klain said recently. Ron Klain is uh, Joe Biden's chief of staff. And in 2019, he acknowledged that if the swine flu of 2009 had been as bad as COVID, the Obama administration would have had a disaster on its hands too. Ultimately, we must learn from history that the point of failure is not always at the top. Even if the buck stops at the top, in a disaster, the point of failure is usually further down the chain of command. And so I think we need to, while not letting the populists off uh, in the least, one needs to remember all their mistakes. One should recognize that there was a more troubling failure at the level of the public health uh, bureaucracy and, and the public health professionals who on paper were well prepared, but in fact didn't deliver when, when the rubber hit the road. That's a really important part of the argument that applies to many other disasters. And I tried to show in the book the, the relevance here of a very different kind of disaster. The, the, the disaster that occurred when the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up just after launch in 1986. The press initially wanted to put the blame on Reagan. Ronald Reagan was president then. But it turned out to have nothing to do with pressure from the White House for an early launch. The reality was that the engineers at NASA knew there was a 1% probability that the thing would blow up. But the bureaucrats at NASA had turned that into one in 100,000 when they reported to Congress. And so Feynman's argument was that the challenger blew up because of middle management. And when I read that brilliant essay on what had gone wrong in, in the case of the, the space shuttle, I thought, you know, that might be a general clue to the nature of disaster, that the point of failure isn't necessarily at the top, even if ultimate responsibility lies with a president or a prime minister. Having having been a politician and a government official in my recent past, I can tell you that's something that keeps you at night if you're in government, because there are things that are happening that you have no idea about. And if they do blow up, of course, the person holding the press conference and apologizing will be you. Exactly. Um, and in a big government, uh, there's absolutely no way you have any, you know, you can you can keep tabs on everything that is going on. So let us now, we have about 15 minutes. I hope my uh, internet connection is doing better now. Let us, so. let, us, um, let us move to a few questions from the audience. And let me start with Thomas Roche, who says, Neil, maybe the problem is, you know, the problem which leads us to be badly prepared is that the decision makers are usually the least affected by catastrophe. So is there a connection between the rise in inequality and the fact that countries did not prepare properly? You know, the, the guys at the top were insulated perhaps, so what did they care? Well, uh, the easy answer to that question is uh, they, they weren't as, as insulated as they may have thought since all these populist leaders we've been talking about got COVID, even if it didn't kill any of, of them. But I, I'll answer the question in a, I hope, more sophisticated way. I think pandemics 
claim to be great levelers, but are not on close inspection. And it is now, I think, axiomatic that the pandemic has uh, struck an unequal society in unequal ways that have magnified the inequality. And even our responses to it, and this goes to your area of expertise, Andres, our massive fiscal and monetary responses have, in fact, magnified inequality further because it's been hugely beneficial to the owners of financial assets to have all this money uh, sloshing around. But it's not always the case. And Thomas, you asked a general question. Decision makers in 1914, uh, the men, uh, and it was all men, uh, who made the decision to go to war, uh, were in fact uh, exposed in the sense that they, uh, in many of them at least, had sons who were certain to be in the firing line. And the, the deaths of uh, sons and in brothers of, of cabinet ministers uh, in the course of the First World War are an interesting uh, kind of counterpoint to your, your argument. Actually, if you were in the, the political elite in 1914, the probability was that your, your sons would be officers at some point, certainly in a large scale war. And therefore, they did run a considerable and, 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 and lasting risk. So I talk about that in the book, because I don't want to give the impression that the elite is always insulated from disaster. Uh, this is a little bit the Titanic story, isn't it? That your probability was greater of drowning if you were in steerage than if you were in first class. A lot of disasters, and COVID is no exception, uh, are like that, but not all disasters. Sometimes the, the elite can end up, in fact, more exposed to disaster as, as happened after 1914. But my case, Neil, I'm not sure I buy this. US precisely part of the problem is that without the draft, get sent off to war and the uh, inverse effect of what you're describing in 1914? Oh, um, Andrews, you broke up a bit, but I think I got a question about Vietnam from you there. Absolutely. In some wars, uh, and certainly by the time of Vietnam, uh, the elite had worked out all too well how to make sure that the burden of warfare was borne by the, uh, the, the young men at the bottom end of the income distribution. So this is definitely not consistently true of, of war. Uh, but I mean, I think most disasters have this inegalitarian character for the obvious reason that when disaster strikes, it's those with the, the fewest reserves, uh, the, la the smallest nest egg, the, the, those with the, the least living space who are most vulnerable at the, at the most basic level. In a famine, it is more likely that you will die of starvation if you're poor than if you're rich. So I think it's generally true, but I don't think that this is necessarily why decision makers make these mistakes. In other words, I don't actually think that the reason for poor pandemic response was an insufficient fear on the part of, of politicians that they themselves might or their relatives might get sick. Uh, in fact, if you think about the situation in January of 2020, we didn't really know much about uh, the virus at that point. And there was clearly a scenario that we were in for a much worse experience than we had. Uh, the time to be most afraid was in January when we didn't know if it was going to be as bad as 1918-19. And what is impressive to me is, is not that the politicians said to themselves, well, we'll be all right. Uh, on the contrary, I think they just failed to realize that if that were the case, we'd all be very vulnerable. I mean, ultimately, a highly infectious disease does not care if you are prime minister or, or a bus conductor. You know, it, it, is, it is, in fact, clear to me that Boris... Uh, and Donald Trump greatly underestimated the risks to their own personal health. Yeah, yeah. I have a number of really good questions from the audience, but there's one thing you said that I have to come back to, Neil. Um, you said in passing, well, it is clear that inequality has been uh, uh, deepened by the monetary and fiscal uh, response. Um, you know, we could spend a whole session just on that, but let me point out one thing. The relevant here, the relevant thing is the counterfactual, right? Uh, imagine a world in which you have no disaster relief and therefore governments are not providing furlough to workers who might have lost their jobs 
or, 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 or not providing relief to small companies, you know, the pizza parlor down the corner that couldn't open, et cetera, et cetera. That is a world in which the inequality consequences of the pandemic would have been much larger. Granted, very low interest rates will bid up the price of assets, so people who were sitting on stocks and bonds are very happy, but the alternative was absolutely you know, inconceivable. At least I think it is. I think I agree with that. I mean, in the end, uh, you're right. We could spend a, at least an hour on this. The, the, the interesting issue, in fact, is that one can discuss this in terms of, uh, of racial inequity. One can discuss it in terms of, of class inequality. One can also discuss it in terms of generational uh, injustice, because here was a disease that disproportionately killed the elderly, but a great part of the sacrifice of containing it was uh, imposed on the young. Mm. The counterfactual of doing nothing is a kind of non-counterfactual because clearly we know from Austin Goolsby's and John Cochran's work that people adapted their behavior even if there were no lockdowns. There's clearly a counterfactual in which there are less drastic measures taken. Uh, there's a counterfactual in which we're Taiwan because we do early action and, and early detection. There are a bunch of counterfactuals, but let me offer one thought. Is the United States uh, more unequal than it would have been if there'd been no pandemic? And I think the answer is to that is yes, that, that we actually, uh, in the end, uh, as we sought to offset the economic impact of the, the lockdowns, we've ended up uh, giving the asset owners another uh, massive bonus and and i think in the counterfactual world of no covid we, we wouldn't have quite so much of widening of the income and wealth inequalities that we've seen clearly with no covid the world would be very different but given covid um having the stock market go up a bit it seems to me like a reasonable price to pay for the kinds of support for families, for health workers. No, no, I'm not. I'm not arguing that it was the wrong thing to do. By the way, I think it was actually the exactly right thing to do once we had embarked on the lockdown course of action. So let let's not get into a, a non-argument about that. We All agree, right. but there's no question that the net result is is that inequality is greater. Oh, without with, without a question. And, and, and I think another net result is that international inequality inequality is going to become worse because yes, as, as a friend of mine who used to be the finance minister of Colombia likes to say, the rich countries did whatever it takes. You know, echoing echoing uh, the current prime minister of Italy, whereas the poor countries did whatever they could afford. Uh, and in many cases, whatever they could afford was not a great deal. Uh, and therefore, in, in the US or the UK, the recovery is swift. In many developing countries, the recovery is going to be very, very slow. But let us not monopolize the floor here. I want to go back to a few more questions from the floor. Here's Alex Bristow, whom I presume is an LSE student. He says, is there any evidence to suggest that Western democracies will learn the lessons of COVID-19? like Taiwan learned the lessons of SARS? And if not, what are the implications for a future more deadly pandemic like the Spanish influenza? Well, I hope that we can learn lessons better than, than we did uh, prior to 2020. And I think there, are, there is some hope that we shall, but there's also a danger that we learn the wrong lessons and end up equally badly prepared for the next disaster. I was interested to read uh, Dominic Cummings', Cummings Twitter thread yesterday in which he warned that any major inquiry might end up being a kind of civil service whitewash. And, and Cummings, who's been much criticized, I think at some level is right that the problem in the UK's COVID response was Whitehall and its way of doing things. And it was when Whitehall was set aside, as in the case of the vaccine procurement and deployment that uh, that things went well. So I, I can see in Britain a danger that we go through a kind of theatrical uh, inquiry and after many years pass, a report comes out of enormous length uh, and, and we don't actually address the fundamental structural problems. What we should be doing, I think, is, is looking at what they did right in Taiwan and South Korea, sending people from uh, uh, our civil service there to look at the ways in which Audrey Tang has been deploying technology in really creative ways. So I think there's a way forward here, but we've got to, I think, identify what exactly went wrong. And that's why I wrote Doom, even although this thing isn't over, we have to start realizing that the problems were 
at root in our illusion of preparedness that our bureaucracy prepared for a pandemic, but the preparations were essentially worthless. The plan was really not worth the PDF file it was saved on. And I think that's not yet been fully recognized because in the media, it's all been about, did Boris do that? Did Neil Ferguson, the other Neil Ferguson do this? Was he violating his own rules? Was Cummings breaking the, 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 the media debate has not been about the right things. And it's the same in the US. Jim Fallows writes a piece for the Atlantic saying it's all Trump's fault. It's pilot error. He was the pilot. Being the president is like being the pilot of a light aircraft. Well, I'm here to tell you that being president is not like being the pilot of a light aircraft. The problems lay with CDC, HSS. There's even a guy named Robert Cadlack, who was the secretary, undersecretary for preparedness. It was his one job. In 2018, he gave a lecture in Texas shortly after another pandemic preparedness plan had been released in which he mused, if we don't have a real insurance policy against a pandemic, we'll be SOL if one happens. I didn't know what SOL stood for, and uh, forgive me for profanity, it stands for shit out of luck. So the guy whose job it was knew that the preparedness plans were basically worthless. And yet we were ranked number one for preparedness in 2019. Those are the things that we need to identify as the real points of failure. And if we don't do that, then we we won't learn the right lessons. And the next disaster, which won't be a pandemic, it'll be something else, will expose just the same pathologies of bureaucratic pseudo preparedness in another part of the government. On that very same theme, you know, government effectiveness, uh, several people not read all of their names are asking a similar question. So I'm going to ask it with my own words here. Uh, uh, a number of the students say, Neil, you've been an advocate of government. Does the pandemic not suggest that, in fact, we need bigger government, more muscular government to deal with these kinds of challenges? Yes, yeah, so I saw Malcolm McAdam called me a cheerleader for the neoliberal paradigm. And I'm trying to remember when I, when yeah, I was... I think we, yeah, I turn off my video. Does that, does that improve the, um, yes, I'm hearing audio? you some, somewhat better. I've no idea. Okay. Maybe somebody in technical support can tell me if I should do the same. Uh, but I'll, I think it may be, I think it may be my internet connection. So let's carry on. I think we'll, uh, people are saying that you are fine. So, okay. um, Clearly, California uh, internet is better than London internet. Um, uh, I'm not sure what lessons we, we should we should take out of from that. I, did you I, hear I, my last question? Or I did. I did. I heard it. I heard right. it. I All heard right. it, Anderson. And I and I had spotted this in Malcolm McAdam's question, in which he called me a cheerleader for the neoliberal paradigm. I'm not sure that that's actually a, a, an entirely fair characterization of my writing on uh, economic historical issues. Uh, but let's not get into that. Let, let me offer the following observation. The, the public health bureaucracy of 2020 in the United States was not, not smaller than it had been in 1957. It was quite significantly bigger. CDC employed more people uh, the Department of Health and Human Services didn't exist in 1957. Uh, there is no question that the scale of government has, has grown significantly, uh, but performance seems to me to have been significantly worse than it was in the 1950s. The federal government in the 1950s was really quite good at things, as it had been in the 1940s. Think, think the Manhattan Project, think the construction of the interstate highways and and think the case I use in the book of the 1957-58 Asian flu which the Eisenhower administration handled uh, with minimal economic disruption and an extraordinarily rapid and successful vaccination campaign so the problem for this argument is that it's not as if government really shrank I mean so-called neoliberals uh, argued for reducing the size of government but in terms of the size of the administrative state in the United States, they were not successful. Uh, they were not successful, except perhaps in the Reagan uh, 
administration, which did shrink the size of the Federal Register. But every other administration, Republican and Democrat, since Reagan, has caused the regulatory state to grow in its, uh, in its size, not only in terms of its cost, but perhaps more importantly, in terms of the sheer volume of regulation that it generates. So 10 years ago, I wrote a book called The Great Degeneration, which argued that the problem with the public uh, sector in the US and to some extent in European countries was that the, as they grew larger, they become uh, less efficient and less effective. And therefore to say that, that making government bigger will solve these problems is to mistake the, the disease for the cure. Uh, the, the argument about uh, spending cuts is I think a peculiar one that, that's relevant to, to the UK more than it is to the US, particularly when it comes to, to public health. There's, so there's a problem of, of bureaucratic uh, sclerosis, which I, I don't think I'm unique in pointing out. Uh, you know, Francis Fukuyama's made a very similar argument, uh, and Mark Andreessen made it recently. We can see when we look at the way that uh, not only federal but state government agencies work, that they really are encumbered with a 20th century way of doing things. And very, very few government agencies have made uh, meaningful and successful use of new technology to improve their efficiency. But there's a second point I want to make. And again, I, I'm, I'm going to push back against the neoliberal cheerleader uh, argument. Most of my recent work has been on the problem of networks in, in the contemporary and historical worlds and, and and a recurrent theme of 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 the square and the tower my last book and of doom is that if you create very large and complex networks whether they're government networks or corporate private sector networks they may be optimized in some ways but they're very fragile in other ways and and they are contagion machines uh, and i think one of the central problems that we confront is that we've we've created two great engines for contagion one for biological contagion, the international uh, air uh, transportation system, and the other, the internet, which is an engine for spreading uh, fake news and extreme views. I don't recognize in my recent work the caricature that some of you, your, your questions imply. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there and, and suggest that, that a closer reading of my work might, might be in order. Okay. Um... We could stay with that subject matter for a long time, but um, but there are other subject matters that I think are just as interesting. So let me turn to some of them. Um, there is one question that I'm trying to find here, which I rather liked. Uh, let me just, we have lots and lots and lots. Oh, there's David Wood, whose job uh, compels me to ask his question. David Wood <laughs> is the chair of the London Futurists. Um, uh, and um, David Wood uh, says, Neil, of all the potential forthcoming disasters, how we know they're forthcoming, I'm not quite sure, but then again, David is a futurist, so he, he ought to know, which are the ones for which society is least prepared and thereby deserve more attention than they get at present? So to, well, to put it differently, what keeps you up at night in sunny California? What are the things that we really ought to be paying attention to? Well, thanks, David. It's a great question. Part of the problem is that we can't predict uh, which disasters will strike, as I, I mentioned earlier. But we can indeed, as you suggest, look at the full menu rather than just pre-ordering the one disaster that we find most interesting. And if I were to uh, pick out a couple I'd say that we are generally uh, poorly prepared for geological disaster in the United States. We think we're prepared, but I am pretty confident that if we had a big earthquake, uh, or for that matter, the, the super volcano in Montana, that we would do just as badly in response as we did to, in response to COVID. That there'll be some 36 page earthquake preparedness plan in Sacramento, but you can be sure that it will be completely useless because there are no drills. I mean, I, I've lived here now for five years. I've yet to see any attempt to prepare in practice with drills, with simulations for the big one. And this is a big problem that Audrey Tang was pointing out to me, that it's not enough to have a plan. You have to actually practice. Uh, this is very obvious to people in the military realm because in the military, you're taught that your plan 
will disintegrate on contact with the enemy. But in civilian administration, the, the thought is apparently entirely lost. And so it's considered enough to have the plan. Until there are proper earthquake drills, uh, California will be in deep trouble if there's if there's a major earthquake. And I can't even begin to imagine the fires that would then break out here. The thing that also worries me a lot is the cyber attack that will certainly accompany any major uh, conflict with China, uh, or for that matter, put with Russia. I think that we are much, much more vulnerable in the United States, and I think the UK, to a full-blown cyber attack than we think. And uh, part of the problem is that as ordinary voters aren't really aware of it. But I mean, if you're running a corporation, you know that cyber warfare is happening all the time. It is not like in the Cold War, where you either were at nuclear war or not. Cyber warfare is a permanent Hobbesian state of nature in which it's it's really just no holds barred. Non-state and state actors are, are capable of causing great pandemonium. And just to, to take an example, the the colonial pipeline uh, closure by a bunch of East European crooks using ransomware is just a trailer for what would be a much, much more disruptive event. I struggle to imagine that the federal government is really in a position to cope with an all-out attack on critical infrastructure. I could go on, David. The book offers you a bunch more things to worry about. And by the way, historians should not mock futurists, but work with them. Peter Schwartz, who now works... Uh, uh, for Salesforce is, is an old friend of mine, and he and I have been brainstorming about uh, futures and pasts for many years, including an event we did years ago at the Long Now Foundation. So yeah, I think this is this is a very, very big problem that we can't predict the disasters, but we tend to focus too narrowly on one or two that really appeal to us. And my basic concern about climate change is not that it's not real, it's real and very worrying, but we devote a very, very disproportionate share of our worrying to that one risk. And these other risks, I think, are largely forgotten about. Andrew Starks has a question which I rather like, uh, so I'm going to read it almost verbatim. He says, if COVID had had the reversed effect on demographics as it has, namely, if it had affected younger people the way COVID is affecting older people, do you think governments would have acted the same way or do you think they would have acted differently? Which I suppose, and these are my words, are governments more beholden to young people or are governments more beholden to old people, older people? Uh, how do we think about the political economy of that? It's a great question, Andrew. Most pandemics, uh, unlike COVID, attack the very young and, and the very old roughly with equal uh, mercilessness. But some uh, unusually, like 1918-19, kill people in the prime of life more than they kill the old. The excess mortality was amongst people in their 20s and 30s in 1918-19. The excess mortality was very high amongst teenagers in 57-58. So COVID is unusual historically, and that make, makes it relatively easy for me to answer that question, I say relatively because we can see from the past that that when a pandemic is killing the young, um, it's much more traumatic. It is much more traumatic if your if your children are dying uh, ultimately than if it's its grandparents, and and we have got off lightly psychologically because the numbers of very young victims have been quite small thus far. Uh, but in some recent work that I, that I did, not so recent actually, I think I began writing about this 20 years ago in the Cash Nexus, I've been arguing for years that generational conflict is more important in contemporary politics than class conflict, or for that matter, racial conflict. And the big division in the US today is, is actually generational. And I think it is a very striking feature of 2020, that very great sacrifices were asked of the young to protect the old. This might have been more credible if the old had been successfully protected. But one of the things that went horribly wrong in most countries early on in the pandemic was the elderly care uh, senicide when through very poor decision making, multiple uh, occupants of elderly care homes were exposed to the virus. If we'd done a good job of protecting the elderly, I think 
uh, the young might have less to grumble about. But in truth, they participated in large scale restrictions on their uh, social, economic and educational lives. And this applies to many of the people on this call in return for not a terrific outcome for the, the most vulnerable groups. And I don't think this is at all surprising because in truth, and I made this point also in, in The Great Degeneration and in an essay that I published 2019 with Ike Fryman on generational conflict, in truth, the young have been on the wrong end of political economy for most of the last 20 years, uh, in, certainly in the US and in the UK. Uh, and this generational imbalance, which manifests itself in multiple ways, is a really strange thing. Now, it's partly that the young are kind of outnumbered by the old politically, not only outnumbered, but outvoted because the elderly have higher turnout. But there's also something else going on here, which is a little harder to put one's finger on. And that is that the, ten the tendency for policy to, to prioritize the interests of, of older age groups uh, at the expense of the young. Uh, Hayek, to mention the great LSC name, uh, would have been amazed by this. It, in the Constitution of Liberty, Hayek predicted that in the post-war world, after a point, the young would rebel against the costs of supporting the elderly in the welfare states that were created after World War II. And that has not happened. On the contrary, the young have been extraordinarily docile in accepting uh, a generational politics that is skewed in favor of the elderly in a whole range of different ways. And future historians will struggle to understand why, why it was that the young were not pressing harder for more generational uh, uh, equity in, in, in politics. Uh, that's one of the dogs that has not barked much in, in recent years. I think one way to summarize that dog is simply the young don't vote as much as uh, as the elderly do. Uh, and that's a universal phenomenon, not simply the US and the UK. And therefore politicians, and I can speak as a retired politician, uh, tend to be much more sensitive to the concerns of the old. Um, right. I, I, think, I, I think the counterfactual of what might have happened is that if the pandemic affected the young more intensely than, than, than it did the old, as, as the question suggested, I am pretty sure that the economic response would have been very, very different. Um, we have about a minute or two left, and I am going to take the chair's privilege of asking the last question, if I may. Um, in the book, Neil, uh, you list five possible failures that condemn societies to getting disaster preparations wrong. And I'm going to read them out, and I'd, I'd like to hear from you which which of the five have been most intensely at work recently, and which one should we worry about uh, in the future. You say um, the five categories that come to mind in identifying why a country may be ill prepared are number one, failure to learn from history. Number two, failure of imagination. I like that one. Number three, tendency to fight the last war or the last crisis. Number four, threat underestimation. And number five, procrastination or waiting, waiting for a certainty that never comes. Were all five at work recently? Uh, will all five or any one in particular of the five be at work most likely in the future? I'll keep it brief as we're almost out of time. All five were at work uh, in 2020 and they will continue to operate uh, as long as we don't emphasize enough in our education of decision makers history. I'll also add science fiction because you need science fiction in your reading diet to be alive to potential technological discontinuities. Planning has got to be less retrospective. It's not only armies, generals that want to fight the last war and, uh, and are always surprised when the next war is different. Uh, and, and then the, the threat underestimation problem, I think, is, is just, uh, you know, my, my daily life. I'm, I'm sitting here, as one of the questioners pointed out, in, in a highly flammable part of the world. Uh, by the way, the, 
the wildfire problem here is not just global warming, it's chronic mismanagement of, uh, of forests. And so the, the constant problem in California is that, th that each year we underestimate the, the scale of the next wildfire season. But, but I think the one to end on is actually number five, waiting for a certainty that never comes. If one thing characterizes the modern Western political class, it is the urge to kick the can down the road, whatever the problem is. And it doesn't matter whether it's monetary policy or we'll just wait for the data or pandemic preparedness. We'll see just how bad the virus is before we take any action. The common factor is this tendency uh, to play for time, hoping, like Mr. McCorber, that something will turn up. And in, in an emergency, it's the very worst thing to do. So if there's one concluding idea I want to leave you with, it is that in an emergency, you can't predict it, but when it strikes, you need to turn on a dime. The most important thing is not to kick the can down the road, but to pick the can up. Uh, and it was that response, that rapid response that helped Taiwan and South Korea do so much better than Western democracies, whether they were populist run or not. Uh, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. But by the way, thanks for all these terrific questions. I've been trying to eyeball them as they've been coming in. And uh, it's, uh, it's been a really enlivening chat. So thanks to you all. Wonderful. Thanks to you, Neil. This has been fun. I wish we had more time, but uh, we're up against uh, uh, the end of our time here. Let me just, first of all, take a minute to thank Neil. This has been a fun discussion. Uh, uh, I hope we can have more of the same in the future. And let me just do a little bit of advertising before we all go home. Uh, first of all, you can buy the book. Um, where is, uh, here we go. You can order the book, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe from our official LSE in Events Independent Bookshop, Pages of Hackney. And uh, if you look at the chat, you can find the actual, um, the actual URL where you can uh, order the book. I am not getting 10% for any book sales, but uh, do buy the book. It is a good, fun, uh, and enlightening read. In addition, uh, let me uh, invite you all to um, another uh, book presentation, also on catastrophes and also on pandemics. We will have LSC alumnus Ian Golden from Oxford University, who will speak about his book, called Rescue from Global Crisis to a Better World. And that is next Wednesday um, afternoon or evening, I'm not sure, but uh, I am sure you can find it on the relevant website. So thank you, Neil. Thank you um, to everybody who joined us this evening, London time. And thank you for all the wonderful LSC staff uh, who made this event possible. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.